The Templeton Twins by Ellis Weiner. Please turn to page 57 for chapter 5. When you hear the bell, be sure to go to the top of the next page to continue reading along. Let's begin. Chapter 5 The Templetons and Their Ridiculous Dog Take a Terrific and Timely Tour of Tick Tock Tech. It took about a month for the Templetons to pack up their belongings and get ready to move. During this time, there were little articles and newspapers and magazines announcing Professor Templeton's transfer to the Tickeridge Bulltock Institute of Technology. When the faculty and administration and students at Elysian University learned that the professor was leaving, they held a big farewell party for him. All of this affection and respect made the Templeton twins wonder more than ever why their father felt it necessary to move. But whenever they asked him, he gave some vague answer. And finally, they stopped asking. Finally, moving day arrived. A huge truck pulled up in front of the Templeton's door, front door. The three men lugged the family's furniture and boxes out of the house and into the truck. Casey naturally felt it was a good idea to bark constantly and ridiculously at the men until John put her in a room and shut the door. The ridiculous dog barked in there too, but it wasn't as annoying. When the moving van was loaded up, the Templetons drove behind it to the little town where the Tickeridge Bulltock Institute of Technology, which we may sometimes refer to not only as TikTok Tech, but TBIT was located. The van went on to the Templeton's new house. The family drove to the Institute. Isn't it marvelous? Their father said as they pulled into the, drive, the main driveway. They came to a stop in front of a grand brick building with a tall white columns on either side of his entrance. Nearby hung a sign that read, Colonial Hall Administration. Where is everybody? Abigail said. The twins had lived all their lives on college campuses, and Abigail knew how busy and bustling such places always were, as students and teachers and visitors and staff walked and jogged and lounged around in the yard and on the benches. Now she spun around and looked in every direction. She gestured toward the grassy quad that stretched out before them. And since a quad is a four-sided space surrounded by buildings, it was quite convenient for her to point to the other buildings nearby as well. Not one single person was walking or lounging or jogging or lounging. The place was deserted. The professor looked up at the giant clock atop the roof of the Colonial Hall. By the way, if you are reading this aloud to yourself or other to others, and if you have pronounced the name of this building as Ko Lo Neo Hall or Kilo You Know Hall, you're in error. Colonial is pronounced Kernel. A colonel is an officer 
in the army. I know exactly where is the R in colonial. Why should we say colonel when there's no R? Believe me, I deplore it as much as you do. And I'm an adult and I'm used to it. It's an outrage. Let's move on. It's quarter to the hour, the professor said, after looking at the clock atop Colonel Hall. The students must all be in class, as they should be. Then he said, let's take a look around. Colleges, as you may know, usually have a number of buildings, each dedicated to a particular department or other specific use. And most of them are named this or that hall. TBIT was no different. As the Templetons and their father drove slowly around the campus, they saw a sign at the entrance of each building that announced its name and its department. The twins and their father drove past Vaughn Hall, headquarters of the Communications Department, Annie Hall, Performing Arts, Donald Hall, English, and Monty Hall, Business Administration Studies. It was as they drove past Jim and Darrell Hall, Music Department, that the twins noticed an odd thing. At other universities, perhaps one building each cluster has a clock as part of the architecture. But at TikTok Tech, every building had a massive grand tower on its roof and every tower had a huge clock. Some of the clock faces had regular numerals, while others had Roman numerals. Some had sweeping hand, second hands, while others did not, but all showed exactly the same time. In addition, big pieces of sculpture stood here and there on the grassy area in front of various buildings, and each of them depicted something having to do with the measurement of time. A slowly moving pendulum, a stainless steel set of interlocking gears, a giant witch, witch, witch watch, an interesting construction of large brass springs. In the small print at the bottom, it says a star. It is true that there are famous people whom your parents or guardians may have heard of named Fawn Hall, Annie Hall, Donald Hall, and Monty Hall. But these buildings obviously were not named after them. If they had been, they would have been named Fawn Hall Hall, Annie Hall Hall, and so forth. Take a second to look at the pictures of all the clocks. The hedge had all been trimmed into those tooth-like patterns called crenellations. You see in clock gears and on castles, in fact. They are all castle-y looking things that tell you this is a castle. Even the leaves of the trees seem to move in a crisp back and forth tick-tock motion. It all felt very orderly and calm, as though the world were moving in a steady, even, unchanging rhythm. Then the twins heard a sharp 
loud noise, a combined clack and slam and bang coming from different directions all around them. Each clock at the same moment was making its own special two o'clock noise. Some chime the familiar ding dong, ding dong tune. Others just chime twice, deeply and loudly. On one building, a pair of doors under the clock swung open and to the sound of gashing gears and shuddering machinery and cracking wood, out came an enormous mechanical cuckoo who cuckooed enormously twice. From the music building came a rippling pattern of bells that ended in two triumphant bongs. Abigail and John traded a look that said, wow. One of them may have been about to say something out loud, but suddenly all the doors of all the buildings flew open. And before they knew it, the quad was bawling with commotion and noise. Hundreds of students swarmed around them, talking and laughing and yelling and teasing and punching and slapping and crying and singing and giggling and arguing as they moved to their next classes in tick-tock marching steps toward every building in sight. One by one, like seconds ticking off, the students marched in f into the front doors of the various buildings until they were all inside. All the doors of all the buildings banged shut at once with a giant resounding slam that echoed into silence around the quad. Once again, the entire college seemed deserted. Abigail began to say something, but her brother suddenly tapped her hard on the shoulder. She spun and saw him holding up a finger, meaning shh. Then he pointed off to the side. At the intersection of several concrete walking paths, stood a little sheltered bulletin board of the kind many colleges have all over campus for posting of public announcements and advertisements. It was covered with notices but about lost cats and offers of guitar lessons and ads for dramatic production and information about clubs to join and movies to see and concerts to attend and all the other events and services that might interest students at a big college. Most conspicuous among them, pinned front and center was a poster featuring a photograph of their father John gave his sister a look that said worth wordlessly, Good grief. That's the most shocking, awful thing I've ever seen. And I couldn't possibly imagine who put it there or why. Abigail gave him a return look that replied silently, it's completely horrible and outrageous and we should make it our business to find out who did this and set him or her straight. The poster welcomed famed inventor Professor Elton Templeton as a visiting fellow at TIP TBIT and invited the public to a lecture the professor would give a few nights later on the subject of personal transport mobility and the problem of linkage that in it